Everything's good now. Hope it lasts. <laughs> All right. Mr. Computer, please. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult the licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed attract and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither fill stockworld.com, the XW, nor its affiliates, nor any of the respective offices. Personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website www.optionsclearing.com to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. The SW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you to the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying a guarantee of any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on the specific or identified day. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any locker. You may incur the results of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or send your information to anyone. All right, fantastic. That is some exciting information. <laughs> All right, let's see. Jürgen, you can come right on over. We can uh, put you on an internship program, no problem. Um, we don't have a mail room, but we have plenty of stuff to do. <laughs> I, I, I could literally think of a hundred things. <laughs> so. All right, let's see. So don't work for other people. That's the theme of the day. <laughs> and also make your money work for you. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what is your money sitting around doing nothing for. See, this is why I stopped working for other people because I realized in my first, in, in basically my first job, I realized that I would never get rich working for other people because, you know, you can't. You just, you're limited by how much work you can do. Even if you're a highly paid lawyer or something like that, you're only limited, you're limited by how many billable hours you're going to put out. Whereas if you can be a job creator and you can skim a little bit off the top of everybody's job or every, the, the profits everybody creates, you have unlimited amounts of money that you can generate. So I decided to become an entrepreneur. It's a much better way to go. And I guess the same logic. I mean, I have that, you know, as you, as you guys know, I mean, I started investing before I started doing anything. I was a kid when my grandfather told me about investing. And uh, so, so to me, I always thought of my time and, and my time spent in my job as an investment. And it just it didn't make any sense to get really good at something for the benefit of somebody else. Um, so I looked for things I could do myself rather than things, you know, rather than things that I, that I would do for somebody else. Um, I also have my dad as an example. My dad was a brilliant, brilliant programmer. Um, and he did all the work, and his partner made half the money, which was funny because his partner, all his partner did, which isn't all. My father could never have done this, but all my partner, all my father's partner did, was develop the contract. So you know, they had a consulting firm, and my dad was a systems analyst, and his partner was really good at like getting into like big government, uh, big governments like uh, city agencies and such and getting the contract. So, so that was his function. And he ran all the back office, and he took care of all this stuff, and he would hire additional programmers to supplement my dad. But the whole thing was based on my dad being a genius. That was the whole concept of the company. My father was one of the best programmers in the country. And um, so he does, they get tons of jobs and do tons of work, but I always looked at him, like, I'm like, you know, Dad, every cent in this company is being generated by you, and he gets half the money. It's like, you know. You know, it's just, it's just, you can see where it's like better to own, you know, better to be in, on his side of the business where you're employing the programmers. Now, Paul, you know, like, look, they made good money, but I mean, you know, for his part, he was never ambitious enough to bring in another person. Now, maybe the dynamic with my dad was that my dad would have been insulted if he started bringing in other guys or whatever, but he that always was a shop that was basically it was my father's partner. Paul 
who got the contract, my father who completed the contract, and they would sub out to like guys to help my dad, but that was it. They never like built another team or did another thing. And, you know, so I realized, like, you, you've got to do that. You've got to be building and pushing and, and growing. And, you know, and, and, and if you do that, and if you have good people, you take good care of them, you don't, need to get, you don't need to take much of their money. You know, you just take a little bit. Don't be greedy. And you can treat people well and still make quite a lot of money as you grow your business. Um, that then leads to, like, how I look at businesses also. Though. When I'm looking at a business, I look at how are they making money? What are they doing? How are they running it? Um, but you, you guys also, though, you have to look at your money this way as well. If your money's sitting around in a bank, not doing anything for you, not generating any money, you really have to rethink, you know, what are you, you know, why can't you put it to work? And the market is where you put your money to work. You know, the market allows you to put your money into something where it's not just sitting idly by. And, you know, as boring as it is, you know, these dividend stocks, you know, which we'll, we'll get into a long-term portfolio on it, you know, these dividend stocks are fairly steady. They're good general investments. They make good inflation hedges because the value of the companies tend to go up with the market and with, and with the dollar and with inflation. And, um, and those stocks will get you a lot more money than you'll get in the bank. I mean, you know that because you, everybody has these relatives who, like, had 1,000 shares or 100 shares of AT&T from 1930 and 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 they and they retired with like five hundred thousand dollars or whatever, you know, just from from some small purchase, because that was how it worked. If you just kept the damn things for for fifty years, you would make some money. And there's lots of stocks like that. But the dividend ones, especially when they reinvest the dividends back into the stock automatically, and you just get more and more stock and accumulate stock, then the stock splits, and you get the special dividend money, and it all stays in the account. It just grows and grows. You're accidentally compounding your interest. And that's a great way to invest. You know, your investments don't have to all be gambling. And, and the money, so when you look at your allocations of your capital, there's, there's a sort of like a prejudice to the market that it's risk investing. And it's not all risk investing. It's, you know, like some, I mean, it's not, it's not risk free, but it's not that risky that you would say, oh, gee, I can't leave my money in the bank. I have to leave my money in the bank getting 0% instead of putting at least some of it into the market where I get uh, 5%, 10%. That's crazy. That's, you, you know, over the course of your life, you're, you're, you, know, you say, oh, I, I might lose the money. You are losing the money because you're going to double, triple, quadruple that money over 20, 30 years. So you did lose the money by choosing to leave it in the bank. Obviously, everything shouldn't go in the market because the market can crash, but you got to take a reasonable amount of risk. You can't just, you know, just let your money passively sit around. All right, where were we? Um, that's my speech for the, for the morning. All right, everybody's up, 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 except the oil, thank goodness. Now, unfortunately, I'm still down 6000 bucks on my oil. I've got 10 contracts short at basically 50-52, which is way down there. And this is my own fault because <clears throat> had I doubled down here, which I should have done, and I knew I knew that. I mean, I was just it was 10 o'clock this morning. I was busy because we were doing the oil inventories and stuff. And I was, had intended when we got up to about 52, my intention was to double down again. And if had I done that, I'd be out, I would have been out here and fine. But I didn't, so now I'm kind of stuck and I'm waiting because now I got to wait for it to either go higher or come back. We just added a couple of short uh, dows. I got uh, how many short beads do I have? I have eight short um, NASDAQs and two short DAOs. Oh, so the DAO is it officially, I like this short at 20,800 on the DAO. I like that short. I certainly like oil short here at 51.15, though obviously it has a pension for going higher. Oh, let's take a look at the dollar. So forget the DAO for now. Dollar's punching up. Voila, there it is. 1065. So if the dollar can make a nice breakout, that's going to also push oil down a bit. The indexes, though, are just flying. I mean, everybody's going back up to <clears throat> to their highs. Nonetheless, I still like it short, especially like the S&P short here at 2375-ish. You know, with a stop, any a stop above. So he hit 2375, went boom back down. So here you are again, right about 2375. If you make that your stop, hey, let's do that just for fun. Where is that? 
23, oh, it's way up here. Nope. What am I doing? Oh. What's wrong with this contract? There's no, uh, there's no trading activity. That's pretty weird. Oh, for God's sake, that's not so true. I'm not picking that up. Um, sorry about that. I'm very confused. I mean, usually you have this sort of thing. Bid size, ask size. Don't know why. Anyway, so just for the example, let's see if it fills. No, it's like there's something wrong with it. Let's try switching it. GC works. Same thing. Oh, wait, there's something. How strange. What if I what if I make uh, this one a yes? Mystery guys. No. Nope. Hmm. I don't know if anyone else is seeing the same thing. That's weird. I cannot trade S and P futures. Everything else is working because the S and T is not working. No idea why. Anyway, well, I would short them here, and the idea now. See, here's the thing: the best entries are when you have a good place to stop out, right? It's close by because these are twenty bucks a contract, twenty bucks a point. So I could only lose forty bucks. So from twenty three seventy three to twenty three seventy five is forty bucks, maybe fifty bucks by the time I stop out would be over. 23.75, right? So I know exactly how much I'm going to risk. I'm going to risk 50 bucks. But how much can I make? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Sorry, I'm thinking of the NASDAQ. This is 50 bucks a contract. Sorry, my apologies. I can lose 100 bucks or maybe 125 bucks because it's 50 bucks a point. Um, on the way down, though, what do I think I can make? Well, I certainly think we can come back to this red line of 23.68. That's five points down. So I could make 500, no, sorry, 250, could make 250, or I could lose 100. Now, that's, those are good odds, right? So I could either lose 100 or make 250, and, and that's if it was a binary thing. But since I really think it's toppy, I think we've gone up too much, and, uh, and the Russell, where's the Russell? So look, and the, the dollar's coming up, the dollar's like it's breaking higher, and the Russell has already turned down and basically took a strong bounce and now it's failing a strong bounce. There's many, many reasons that I think this can go down. Oh, by the way, see here, this is uh, 10 o'clock, right? And the Russell let us down. What time did this fall start? 10.25. What time did this fall start? 10.20. And I'm not kidding. It's here 10 o'clock. By 10.25, the Russell had already made a pretty nasty turn down. So here we are with the Russell turning back down again, and I'm telling you right now, that was a good signal to show that you should be shorting these things. So as I said here, we got 54.78 on the NASDAQ and 23.72.50 now on the S&P, and that's what we call shorting the laggard. You figure out who's leading the pack, which index, which index or which indicator of any kind is leading the way. And if you can figure that out and watch it, then you watch to see which has, you know, who has, who of the other indexes you're watching. So here's the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Russell, and we need the Dow. I left out yet. Okay, so here's the Dow, and the Dow's another good one. I said that at 20,800. Oh, we did two shorts. That's right. Wait, if I did two shorts, why am I losing money? Oh, no, because I did it earlier. No, let's get some more. So I can do the Dow, I just can't do the S&P. All right, good. 
Now I feel better. All right, <clears throat> so my average here is now 27.72. But I'm saying short up here at 27.90. You stop, as you can see here, it went up to 28.08. But uh, you know what? We're, the premise is that the Russell is going to keep going down, and it's going to start dragging everybody else down with it, just like it did at 10 o'clock. And if it does, also what you're going to see is you've got this pattern where you're going to see you know, how those uh, trend lines go, right? You have a trend line that's going from here to here. It failed this line, then it failed this line. Now it will hopefully go below this line. But we'll see. Now, if, it's, if it finds support here, I would then get nervous to say it's actually just consolidating and maybe go back up. But we'll take a look and see how it does. But those are my shorts that I like right now. So we caught this at a very good time. All right, let's see if we have any questions for now. You still like KC? Yes, KC N7, yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a, I mean, I actually like them until July. At some point, look, uh, coffee, coffee, coffee. Okay, topic. Okay, coffee is very short term coffee is very subject to whatever the latest crop report is, right? Um, so last July, you see how we peaked up, you see how everything went boom, 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 boom into July? So that's all we're doing. We're sort of playing the seasonality of the thing. It was last year, but then last year there was a little peak in March. We didn't get much of a peak here in March. But even if things don't go well, we don't need much of a pop in July to be happy. And last year we had a very big pop in July. If even we got to just 150, we'd be thrilled, right? Um, you know, our macro picture on coffee is that global warming is causing crop disruption, which is in, in going to be bad. We have not had generally bad crop reports so far. We've had pretty good crop reports. And um, but, but, but those are not the regions that we thought we were going to have bad crop reports. It was north of the equator. We expect bad reports, and those guys aren't going to report until late the spring. And then we'll have the information. So uh, in theory, we should have, some, we should have a, a fairly good idea that there's going to be a, a bit of a shortage this year. Not a shortage, but, you know, like it will be a more expensive crop this year, a little bit less than there was last year, or not, not a less of a cushion between supply and demand that will cause a tighter market. Um, another factor involved also is that uh, there's a lot of competition among the, the coffee companies to get the good beans. There are good beans and bad beans. So the good beans end up being in tight supply. And this is, these are not the good beans. These are, these are basic grind them up, uh, you know, grocery store coffee beans that we're bidding on. But conceptually, it tends to drive prices up. If, if any of the kinds of beans start going up in value fast, it can drag the market higher. You know, so in other words, Starbucks has to have their beans. They can't not have it. And every time they, it's an interesting thing, because every time they introduce a line of beans, I found this out because of the Jamaican coffee they're selling now. I, you know, asked a bunch of questions. Um, you know, they've got to sell their beans. So for them to decide that they're going to carry a line of beans, they've got to have a really firm line on supply. Because they don't like to, to get people used to buying something and then say, oh, no, we don't have that now. You know, so they want to make sure they've got plenty of it. And so it's a very big deal for them to add a new kind of coffee to their line. Um, you know, something, you know the, something too popular or whatever is the problem. So we'll see. But Starbucks has a very big uh, summer, you know, summer frozen coffee line. And uh, they tend to get a lot of demand in the summer. It's kind of the opposite of what you think. You think it would be more in the winter, but apparently the summer is when they really get through this stuff. So we'll see. All right, but you know, and again, we're looking at, at a global warming macro. This could take years to play out, not not weeks or days or whatever. But, but look at this picture also on the monthly. Oh, I seem to have set up those. There you go. So you know, we're you know we're so we're way below the norm now. 
And we're just looking to get kind of back to the norm, which would be like maybe $200 would be like the low of the, low of the decades long channel. Even one, but again, 150 is not an ambitious call. So you just keep playing it long, and we'll get there eventually. That's there. There doesn't seem to be any logical reason we wouldn't go higher. We may go a bit lower first, but there's no logical reason that we're going to stay low and not get better. It's not oil. It's coffee. It's a different concept. <laughs> And of course, even oil is taking up now, right? That's interesting. Let's say I want to be, uh, compare the coffee chart to oil. So here's here's coffee. So it had a big heyday, and then it kind of died out, and had another heyday dies out, and now let's see if oil looks like that. Here's oil. Up, generally flat. Big heyday died out. Not much of recovery. Really died out. <laughs> so and, and oil, we're looking for it to go back to sixty. You know, again, again, we're not looking for an ambitious move. And by the way, I'm, sh I'm short. I understand I'm shorting today, but over the summer, we do expect to see sixty again. I, I don't ever expect to see a hundred again. I think this is just all idiocy. Oh, and by the way, when you see a hundred going back all these years, that's this contract. So it's not really, it's not real information. This contract that they're in right now, the current um, April contract, was $100 in 1997. So the April 20-year contract was 100 bucks. Nobody buys it. See how see the volume? Nobody buys those contracts that far in advance. And all these, imagine all these people who did buy it got burned. You know, I mean, maybe they cashed out here, but you, you just imagine how many people got burned owning these contracts a long, long term. We thought like in 20 years it was going to be way over 120 a gallon for oil. And then, and then these four sons of bitches, oh my God. <laughs> it's not good at all. So, and look at the volume. It's got a really, I mean, the volume of contracts in the last few years has really gone up. It's interesting, the stock volume has gone down, but the volume of uh, people trading contracts on oil has gone way up. Was there a question that was answering coffee? Oh, yeah, we got sidetracked. Uh, you don't have depth on any of them. They changed the permissions on my broker Monday, and the market depth on some exchanges doesn't include. Okay, but but I'm not talking about, I'm, wait, yeah. I'm talking about these little bit, these bit ASCIIs right here. I have them on everything. I've never seen, I've never seen it without. It's really kind of weird. I, I didn't actually know. It, I, I've never seen that on the S&P. It's so strange. I'm going to have to call them and find out what's going on. What is Trump talking about? Oh, the king, he's talking to the king of Jordan. Okay. Oh, you have the problem too, John. Okay, well, if anybody finds out why this is happening, it would be nice to know. How, maybe it's just broken. How much of SpaceX success rubs on his Tesla? Hmm. Ah, how much of Pixar success rubbed off to Apple? Okay, Pixar was wildly successful. Jobs sold it for, what, $3 billion or something like that to uh, Disney. Um, he was running it at the same time, and he got a big offer and sold it. Did it did it improve Apple time? No, not really. It didn't nobody nobody actually cared. Um, I think SpaceX is one of those things that that the Tesla bulls like to point to and say, oh look, and he's also got SpaceX. In fact, a lot of people think SpaceX is Tesla, but it's not. It's a totally different company. Um, I, I mean, to me, if you look at it logically, it's a huge distraction. I want Elon Musk to make me money selling cars. I don't want him spending any time launching rockets to Mars. Jeff Bezos does this too. It's like a hobby for rich people. Um, <laughs> you know, but, but I don't want, you know, as, as, as clever as Elon Musk is, and I guess, you know, look, if you want to invest in a company like that, you've got to put up with whatever he wants to do. But, you know, if it's not up and running and profitable, it's sort of a disservice to his shareholders to be running off and, and doing something else like SpaceX when he's got to really be focused on selling Tesla. 
And they don't, by the way. There are no, there are no like Tesla commercials. You know, some magazine stuff, but not much. But there's no commercials, and they're not convincing people to buy Teslas. Oh, I mean, they don't have the production to sell them anyway, but that's beside the point. Um, they're not building, you know, they're not building that brand. And Tesla's, there's this assumption that everybody wants one, but that's not true. There's a certain amount of people who are into that kind of thing who want those kind of cars. But once you exhaust those people, the same people who bought Priuses, basically. Once you exhaust your supply of the kind of people who, who, don't, who are willing to have a little bit of inconvenience but want to have an electric car, then you kind of have to start competing with regular cars and all the specs of regular cars and so on and so forth. And uh, those people don't give a crap about SpaceX. You know, now, if you say rub off as far as like the SpaceX effect, um, you know, will SpaceX uh, affect uh, people's buying Tesla? Yeah, it affects the stock in that it's another cachet that says, hey, you know, look how cool this, this guy is. He's, uh, he does more. He goes to Mars. Of course, he can make a car. Which, which again, I've heard that. I've heard that from so many people who invest in Tesla. They're like, you know, I'm like, okay, here's the facts. You can't. Oh, there was a nice in, in chat. We just shared one of these. There was a guy who was talking about. It, I, I reprinted it. The facts of Tesla. And I, I can't, we've talked about it many times, but he, this guy summed it up nicely. He's got a bit of an automotive background. So he's saying, look, Tesla. This is as of last last year. I think they finalized it now. But the point being, Tesla has not finalized the Model 3 specification. And uh, and the automakers and consultants are saying that even if he completed the design in June, which he didn't last year, it was not completed until, you know, the fourth quarter of last year. Under ideal conditions, automakers have launched new assembly lines in 18 months. Under ideal conditions, 18 months, typically they take two to three years. Two to three years. And he's, he's got a time frame to have mass production of this car 18 months from June. That's the end of this year. He says he's going to have a mass production assembly line ready to roll. And, again, nobody, nobody, everybody has to sign these, you know, um, NDAs. So, but they are saying fiat. For some reason, Fiat doesn't make him sign an NDA. So they think Fiat is converting Sterling Heights, which is the existing plant. Okay, it's already there. It already makes a different kind of car, so it's a terrible example. But that plant is going to make Ram pickup instead of whatever the hell it was making, and they're going to increase capacity 50%, and that's a three-year job. And that's a Fiat Chrysler who has infinite amounts of money. They don't have to go out to, to raise more capital every time they need some more to build something. They've already got it. Not only that, they have uh, 10 times or more people than Tesla does in the first place, so they could put 10% of their experienced staff to work to build this plant. Because don't forget, you told them 300,000 cars for them is a, is a minuscule percentage of their global sales. Their global sales are, uh, I'd have to say, at least 10 million. Probably, probably more, but let's say 10 million globally. So you're talking about adding 3% to uh, global sales. That's nothing. Tesla's talking about adding 100% to global sales just to get to 200,000. Adding to 500,000 would be 250%, wait, no, would be 400% from where they are now. Like, see, even I'm getting confused with all the bullshit. They're only at 100,000. That's it. They're not even at 100,000. They, they, they delivered less than 100,000 last year. They're, they're at a rate now, since they did 25,000 in the first quarter, they're at 100,000 rate now. They have to get from here to 500,000, which would be 40,000 a month. They have to get, so, so they go from 25,000 cars a month to 40,000 cars a month. To get to get anywhere close to five hundred thousand cars. Not a, I'm sorry, it's not a month, it's a quarter. Oh my math. Sorry about that. They have to get from forty thousand cars a quarter to hundred and twenty thousand cars a quarter to get to five hundred thousand cars, and that is four times as many cars. And it's taken them thirteen years to get to hundred thousand. It's just silly. It's just, it really is silly. 
And, and here's a guy making a good point, like the example of fiat. is like saying, look, fiat can't do it. And, they, and they've got and the fiat, they can just send, you know, look, if you have a million workers like fiat does, right, and you, have, and you want to build a plant that's going to make 3% more production, you can easily take 3% of your workers from all your plants, and the other 97% of the workers can pick up the slack in those plants so you're not impeding your operation. And then the 3%, so you get 97% of the people in town to work 3% harder, right? Put, up, put them on 3% more hours. That seems like an easy concept. Then they would take the three. Then they would take all the experienced workers they need and stock up that plant. And then those workers can in turn train people full time to to add the new capacity. And then they go back and go back to their old jobs, and everybody else gets back to normal. That's how you do it. But that's not possible for Tesla. They don't have that many people. When you're adding 100%, that means every single person who's working would have to be training someone as well or at, at, at three times over. <laughs> oh, my God, it's so ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> I mean, come on. It's, it's totally ridiculous. It cannot happen. That's what bothers me about Tesla, okay? They are lying to people. But they always have. They haven't hit their targets ever. They haven't hit their production targets. They haven't hit their money targets ever. The only target they hit, like they hit their production target for this quarter, they hit it because everybody lowered the estimate for the tenth time. If you go back six months, you know, if you go back to the middle of last year, they said they were going to make forty thousand cars in the first quarter. Never happened. But but obviously, if you go by the what they say they're going to make as of January first and what they make on March thirty first, congratulations, they hit a number. But, but now they're bullshitting about the 500,000 cars thing. It just is not going to happen. Just logistically, if you look at the roads and everything, don't get another factory. It's not going to happen. you got to have uh, – did this guy say it? I think in this article he talks about it. There's 8,000 parts in the car. 8,000 parts. Now, I will bet you that 6,000 of those parts are redundant to the Model S. Okay, so, so let's give them that. Let's say that, that for the most part, they're going to use the same suppliers and the same everything and just get more stuff for most of the pieces that they get. But they've got a couple of thousand, still a couple of thousand new different parts that have to be picked up and coordinated and, and uh, shipped in and so on and so forth. And you've got to stack them up, and you have to have them ready to go. And, and somebody made a re- very good point. You could have 99% of your parts. You could have 7,999 of your 8,000 parts ready to go. But you can't make a single car until you have that 8,000th part ready to go also. So again, to say you're going to go from zero to whatever in 18 months, is, is just ridiculous. It's, it's in, you know, even for the most experienced car company in the world, it's ridiculous. It's not even something that a normal company would even promise to do. And this guy just goes around and says, oh, yeah, of course we're going to hit our numbers. They never hit their numbers. All right, so that, that's the problem with Tesla in, in, a, in a nutshell. Interactive brokers can see depth. Okay, that's good to know. What's the read on the dollar? Yes, absolutely. The dollar should be the dollar should be between 100 and 103. So 10150 is the midpoint on the dollar. So if you can find it, one dollar. Oh my God! Let's click everything twice to get to go. Um. All right. This stuff doesn't tell you much because <clears throat> you have the um, the advent of the euro. You have other currencies. It's all it's all geopolitical, really. The value of a dollar. It's not. There's no intrinsic value. It's piece of paper. It's a piece of it's piece of paper that says to trust God. Uh, <laughs> that's about all it is. Um, but given the current geopolitical situation, I think 100 is a firm floor, even though we did just go below it. Let's take a closer look. Um, 
So I think 100 is a firm floor. Our Fed is tightening. Here's the key. Our Fed is tightening. Less supply of dollars will make it more valuable per dollar. Our Fed is tightening. Our economy is growing. More demand for dollars. And other countries are not. So relative to the other countries, we should have a decently strong dollar for, for probably the foreseeable future. Basically, until the ECB begins to unwind their own QE program. And even then, it will be comparative. So we'll have to see, because their QE is about the same size as our QE, basically. And we have to see who's unwinding more and who's doing more and so on and so forth. But clearly, We've made the first move in tightening. I mean, not not compared to to, to Turkey or somebody like that. There's other, there's other countries that have like uh, not Turkey. They're not tightening. They're loosening. Um, I think Turkey's paying 14% interest though, or something like that. You know, not the one of better there. Uh, Venezuela's inflation's out of control. So you know, there's there's a demand for dollars as stability all over the world now. The, the tricky thing is what happens if Trump messes with the trade? Then all hell can break loose. So dollars are very tricky bets because obviously when you send something out of the country, if you ask to be paid in dollars, it creates a demand for dollars. Most people do ask to be paid in dollars. Like they, um, like when you buy, you know, when you're buying clothes from. Um, well, closer to example, you're buying the iPhone. Apple doesn't have a price for the iPhone in yen and yuan and baht and blah and you know in every single possible time ring it. They, it. They're not every single possible currency is not a different price for Apple. They sell an iPhone for seven ninety five US, and it's your problem what it converts to. Okay, but they want seven hundred ninety five bucks from you. So. If you're a foreign buyer of the, of the iPhones or whatever, you have to just come up with 795 U.S. dollars. That, you, know, they'll, you, you can't really complete it, and a lot of manufacturers like that. So the more stuff we export, the more dollar demand there is overseas because they need the dollars to pay the invoices. Plus, all oil commodities, in fact, all commodities are basically traded in dollars. So they get priced out in dollars, and they'll be traded in dollars. That creates a huge demand for dollars too. So you see more commodity trade in that good to the dollar also. Um, and then you've got, of course, the inherent U.S. supply. Now we just had a big jobs report, and that labor is a demand for dollars because you have to pay your workers dollars. So if you have 250,000 new workers, like we just uh, had in the ADP report, those 250,000 workers, well, look. Um, so 250,000 new workers times 40 hours a week times uh, $20 an hour, that's $200 million a week times 365, oh, not times 365, times 52. So that's $10 billion, okay? so. So just the additional jobs this week would create the demand for $10 billion this year. has to come from somewhere. $10 billion is not nothing, and especially if that's how many jobs we add every month, then you're into like $100 billion is now being demanded. That's like a whole month's worth of treasury auctions being sucked up somewhere. So that's demand for currency. Now, as you are the world's biggest currency, though, it's, it's not that big of a deal, but if you see those kind of, if you ever see job numbers like that coming out of Europe or something like that, then you'll see a huge demand for euros that would then depress the dollar and raise the euro. Oh, and of course, the other big thing about the dollar, though, is the euro is not necessarily a going concern. Okay, it'll, it'll, the euro will probably strengthen up if Le Pen loses her election in France, which she probably will. Uh, hopefully will, because it's as crazy as electing Trump, but electing the pen. Um, <laughs> and, and the world can't handle two people like that on, at the same time. We, we had that, didn't we? We had Hitler and Mussolini. 
Um, you really, you really don't want to have two volatile leaders, uh, you know, who are both anti-government, uh, whatever, you know, leading uh, chaos. Anyhow, um, so uh, even assuming there's no chaos, the, you know, the euro is got to be based on the fact that there's going to be a European Union. And anytime you hear trouble in the European Union, people get nervous. So, so the U.S., even though we have uh, a crazy president, the U.S. still looks a little bit more stable than Europe at the moment. You know, once once Le Pen is out, and uh, if Merkel, oh, and also Merkel, if Merkel isn't reelected again, chaos. So there's all kinds of ways Europe can become unstable. China is obviously has all kinds of problems with the banking system and everything else. And then Japan is the world's most indebted nation. So I don't know why their, you know, their currency is insanely overvalued as it is. So there's really not too many reasons that the dollar shouldn't be stronger right now. So the, so we had a little dip, but I don't see it lasting. I think we'll be back around 101.50, 103 in that range. All right. Uh, I'm using interest for oh, so okay. You check with our BBY positions before earnings as they close. What's the most it would drop? It's negative report, please. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, come on. All right, let's be realistic. B B B Y. Okay, Bed Bath and Beyond is at thirty nine dollars. Already had a nice dip. And we have, is it in our 5% portfolio? Oh, it is not. Okay, so there we go somewhere. Let's be in the long-term portfolio. 178%. Wow. Wow. Just, wow, was it just 160? Was it not just 160 this morning? This is crazy. We're actually, I mean, we're moving, well, we're moving more than Dow's moving. We're moving uh, double the Dow. It's scary. That means you lose double the down on the way back down. BBBY, uh, right? Whoa. Oh, is that all we have? <laughs> we have the forty dollar put, and we only have five anyway. We have five forty dollar puts. And we sold them for 450. So our net here is 450 minus 40, uh, 35, 35, 60. So 35, 50, sorry. So 35. So we're in for net 35, 50. They're at 38, 90. So we have a 10 percent cushion on that. But it doesn't matter because it's a 2019 position. So even if it goes down now in in April of 2017. We still have 20 months for it to recover. So it's really not that important. I mean, over the course of time, many of these have been red. This one's red now. Who's that? Target. Okay, look, well, Target's red. I'm not worried about Target. I mean, you know, we're, we're, going to, we're going to adjust it at some point, but right now I'm not worried about Target. I'm going to be very happy to roll these 2019s and wait a little longer. That was just our first try at it. Didn't work out. We'll go again. This is our first try at Best Buy. I'm not even, but I'm not worried about it. It's, it's, you know, at where it is right now, I certainly wouldn't worry about it. And if they have bad earnings, we'll deal with it. I don't, they're not in the five cent portfolio too are they? No. So I still like it. But anyway, so Yahoo. Let's see. B D D Y. I don't know if you were in the chat room. We had my premise for Death Buy is that look, it's kind of like Home Depot and Lowe's. Okay, it's not an impulse item. <clears throat> you don't go to Best Buy. Uh, Best Buy. You don't go to Bed Bath and Beyond because you're in a shopping mood. They're not really at malls, right? They're kind of destination stores like. Lowe's and Home Depot, because they are the same kind of buying decision as Lowe's and Home De De Depot. You want to buy some bedding. You want to buy towels. You want to buy this. You, know, you want to buy stuff that, that you don't go to a mall for. 
You want to buy some toilet seats. You want to buy uh, whatever. I, I, I frankly, I don't go there much. So, no. <laughs> but you know, it's like they have bathroom fixtures and tiles and toilet seats and things like that. So you're not you're not going there for discretionary spending, and it's discretionary spending that's having trouble. Um, people are very confident in their jobs now, comparatively, and they're willing to spend money on their home. So I think that I think that Bye Bye Baby or Bye Bye Baby Bed Bath and Beyond, one of these BB stores, I think Bed Bath and Beyond should be doing pretty good. Also, look, they're valued now at six billion dollars, not even six billion dollars, okay? And they make eight hundred million dollars. So let's say it's a billion. If it's a billion, their PE is six. So the P is like seven, eight, there's about eight something. So the P is around eight. Yeah, eight times eight is 64. So their PE is, is less than eight or right about eight. That's based on last year. That's not forward earnings. That's based on what they've actually already earned in the last 12 months. And their business isn't going down. 11, 5, 11, 8, 12 is not going up. It's not going down. Profits have gone down a bit. They're getting a little bit of a squeeze. But on the whole, this is a solid business. Now, let's see what the analysts are expecting. We go over to the analysts and we say, what do you guys think? Well, they think that last year they earned five and this year they might earn a bit less, 450, but that's 450 per $38 share. And next year they'll earn 460. So basically it's a good, solid, steady business. And also, Nobody's got a buy on them. Everybody's got hold, 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 hold. A bunch of sell seats, like, like no buy. All these analysts, nobody, nobody actually likes these guys. So it's not like there's a lot of expectations for them to perform or do anything good. So any kind of good news at all, positive for the stock. Okay, and I think they're going to do better than expected. All right, based on the consumer trends I'm looking at, I think they'll do better than expected. They do worse than expected. We'll figure out how it works, and we'll figure out what to do next week. But uh, I'm certainly not worried about it, and I, and I strongly endorse them as a new trade. Where do you see Apple going as a target for the year? Yeah, Apple, I think Apple probably, I mean, I, thought, I expected Apple to be at 160 next year. So, you know, being at 145 now is not, Really, that far ahead of schedule. I thought that, I thought now they'd be about 130-ish. Um, so they're they're you know they're 10 percent over their target basically. It's not a big deal. Um, I, I think I don't think they're going to be. I don't think they'll be over 150 at the end of the year. I think 150, 160, probably 150. I think the. Um, I, did we find out if that's true about the? There's a rumor that the iPhone 8 is delayed. I don't believe it's true. I think it was just a rumor, but. So when, you, when you come close to Apple earnings, people start floating these rumors to, to manipulate the stock price. And so this morning they were talking about the iPhone 8 being delayed. Apple, the reason you can do this with Apple is because Apple refuses to discuss anything like that. So they, even if you call them up and say, somebody said this about you, they won't confirm or deny it. They will tell you nothing. So you can make up any crap you want about Apple and they're never going to deny it. They, they'll never say, oh, that guy's lying. Um, Da, 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 da. There's, there's no legitimate news here telling you that the, uh, the watch, investors, bullish, Apple's Mac Pro. And I, I, you, there would be tons of articles talking about Apple's delay. Oh, here you go. Apple, I see the, it's the same report. Everybody's referring to the same report. They're going to talk about some Chinese thing. Ah, Chinese language, electronic. So the Taiwan-based industry news, DigiTime, cites a report. So DigiTime cites a report in a Chinese language daily newspaper that says there are technical in, limita limitations or whatever. Now, it's possible that this is true about the OLED panels, that there are technical issues with the OLED panels. That just means Apple won't use the OLED panel. But, but frankly, I think at this point, I'm not sure what the release date of the 8 was supposed to be, but at this point, I think they either made them or they didn't. 
So I, I don't see how anything that's happening right now could possibly affect the, the release date of the iPhone because I think if it's set, it's set. You know, Tim Cook doesn't go, we're going to release the iPhone on, on June 5th. You know, the iPhone 8 will come out on June 5th. He doesn't say that and then, and then not actually know that every – again, it goes back to that part issue, right? Like, so the iPhone's got a 1,000 parts in it. Tim Cook doesn't say we're putting the, we have an iPhone for June 10th when one of the parts, especially the screen, isn't there in the warehouse. He's got all 1,000 parts in the warehouse. And, and Tim Cook is a, he's an operations guy. Tim Cook used to run his, his old job at Apple when, when Jobs was there was Tim Cook was the guy who would make the, efficient, the, the assembly lines more efficient and would make all the supply chains more efficient and would drill down on the prices. That was his primary job at Apple, was making sure things were produced efficiently and on time. So this dude is not going to miss a deadline. So if he lets you say that, if he says there's a deadline, there's a deadline. So that's, that, that story is almost certainly bullshit about there being a delay in the iPhone. But even, even that, though, so still, the pricing of Apple reflects they're not being delayed, and then today it hasn't even gone down, so I don't think anybody believes these Chinese guys. Te Tesla robots could help out. Yeah, but, but everybody's got robots. You know, look, here. <laughs> I, I love that. See, this is the funniest thing, because nobody ever, nobody ever checks. Uh, Chrysler... Robot assembly. Must didn't invent these things. Here you go. Here's a, here's a Chrysler robot assembly plant. Ooh. There you go. How's that? Uh, and here's with the other one. Here you go. I mean, God knows what they're doing, but, but that's, that's how auto plants run these days. And they've run like that for years. I mean, I, you know, and you know this. It's a, if you think about it, see, tailpipe, that's not a Tesla. If you think about it, you know this is true. Okay? You've known it for years. It's just Tesla makes a big deal about it. They act like they invented something. And, and maybe, maybe you could say, oh, they use more robots than anybody else and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. Everybody uses robots. And you know what sometimes... Using more robots isn't always the answer. And take it from me, I'm going to get paid a lot of money to be an efficiency expert for big companies. It's not always better to have more. Okay, you have to, you have to experiment and find the right balance. And so if Musk says, oh, I'm going to act, you know, I'm going to say we have more robots doing more stuff, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. It doesn't mean he's actually doing a better job. And, and Musk actually has no idea. He has no idea how to manufacture mass-produced cars. The Tesla is not a mass-produced car. It is a limited production car. It's like a hand-crafted car. You know, like, like Mercedes or Porsche puts out. They put out limited amounts of cars, and each one gets enough individual attention because when you're only putting out, and only, you know, Porsche is putting out a lot more than 100,000 cars, but... When you're only putting out 100,000 cars, when you're only selling 2,000 cars a month, and you've got, I think, 30,000 employees. Hang on a second. Let's see. All these things can be checked. See? You guys don't realize this. Like, whenever I tell you something, I, don't, I, I always try to check it. I mean, it's so easy to look stuff up. It's like, why should I say something that's not right? Tesla, 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 17,000 employees. Okay, so 17, that's why I said 30,000 did sound right. So 17,000 employees making 2,000 cars a month, okay? They're not all accountants. <laughs> so, and they're certainly not salespeople, right? They don't have salespeople. It's basically that's your auto plan. And, that, and that's in line with any auto plan. Like if you look at a company that makes a lot more than them, like uh, GM, They've got 225,000 employees. So more than 10 times more employees making more than 10 times, well, more, well, a lot more than 10 times more cars. So GM, on an on a employee per car basis, because GM makes 100 times more cars than Tesla with only 10 times more employees. So that's automated. But I'm saying each, each company, they figure out the right balance because 
Some, and, and by the way, the German companies, the, the ones that make luxury cars, they'll tell you that they would never let a machine do this or that or that. There's certain processes in the thing that they absolutely want their people on it, hand polishing, hand balancing, you know, things that they would not trust the machine to do. So the more things you turn over to a machine, you, you, could, you know, you may not be the best way to go. And, uh, you know, you talk to some of these luxury car designers, they'll, you know, you go, you go down to one of their plants. Like if you buy a Ferrari, you go down to the Ferrari plant, you see how they make it and all that. Um, if you buy some of the Mercedes, they, like, they take you down. You can go to Germany and, like, go tour the plant and, and you watch your car being built. And the guy sign the engine who works on it. Um, you know, those, there's a certain way that you make a car that you can make it by hand, you can make it by machine, or somewhere in between you find a balance. So, but, but, but don't let anybody tell you Tesla. You know, it's the fastest way in the world, right? Look, how long does it take you to show you? Look, here's 225,000 people making 10 million cars. Don't tell me Tesla is more automated than, than those guys. Here's Ford, 200,000 people making 10 million cars. What the hell is, is, is Elon Musk doing with 17,000 people making 100,000 cars? Literally five people per car per month. And yeah, obviously there's some staff, you know, you need to hear. Maybe these guys have 10,000 staff, maybe. I, I doubt it. But maybe they have 10,000 internal employees who run, who run the operations. Um, so even so, though, it's still grossly inefficient. There's no, you know, Tesla doesn't have a patch on any of these guys for automating or building or mass producing or anything. He has no experience mass-producing automobiles. He's produced automobiles. He has not mass-produced automobiles. It's a completely different ballgame. And like I said, Tim Cook, his entire job at Apple, working under Steve Jobs, as a visionary guy, and there's Tim Cook, and Tim Cook's entire job was to basically make sure that stuff got built on time, on budget, and so on and so forth. And if you don't have that guy there, you get crushed by your competition. So maybe Musk has that guy. Maybe he doesn't. I get the feeling he doesn't. I don't think they know what they're doing over there. But we'll see. This is a good test run for them. See if they make this Model 3 correctly. Oh, can you imagine if it gets recalled? Uh, imagine if they mess it up and it gets recalled. What a disaster. Um, let's see. Tesla, okay, yeah. Send your PM if you can please respond to help me in my position. Okay, if you send me, I don't know what you mean, PM? Uh, is that an email? If you did, I hardly ever check my email. I've been really behind because I had my birthday last week and I've been out too much. Um, as you can hear from my voice. But uh, I will take a look at this. May, you have to ask in chat, okay? It's, I, I, I can't, like, personally answer um, messages. Yeah, I don't know. Where would a private message be? Like, on what medium do you send it? That's the question. You think in chat. In chat on Phil Stock World? Okay, anyway, if I find it, I'll be happy to answer it. But, uh, but look, generally people ask me questions in the Phil Stock World member chat, or you can ask it here, whatever it is. I mean, it can help you with a position, but, you know, it's, uh, it depends on how complicated it is. Of course, you can't spend all the time helping individual people. But I will do my best. Let's see. Are you impressed with how gold is doing versus the dollar, and why are the miners not responding? Uh, people don't think it's going to last. That's why. People, people don't have faith that gold is, is here to stay, or silver for that matter. So they're getting a lag. You know, and, and look, miners generally have low PE, and that's why it's a cyclical thing. It goes up, it goes down. Sometimes they make money, sometimes they don't make money. So they get a fabulous return for like a year or two, and then all of a sudden it goes back to like barely breaking even. That's why they end up having, that's why they have your piece. And 
people forget that. They get all, they, you know, it happens every time. Every time the cycle goes up, everybody gets all excited about the earnings. Same thing with the, with the, uh, re, with the um, home builders. They go through a cycle where they make a ton of money. Then they go through five years where they make nothing. Then they go through a cycle where they make a ton of money. Then they go through five years and make nothing. The problem is the investors, they don't buy when they're making nothing, like we bought of Navy, right? We, they don't buy when it's making nothing. They only buy when it's all the way up at the top. So what did Subnavian do? We sold out, didn't we? We got out of Subnavian. I miss those guys. They're probably going to be upset. They're going to be high. Oh, two bucks. Not so bad. So, you know, we were the, we were the only idiots buying Subnavian down here. Nobody else would buy. Nobody believed they could actually go up. And then when they did this, we got the Yeah, that's when we got out. We got out over here, somewhere in this area. But we, we were buying and buying and buying. We had a huge position in Havabian. Because I, the same thing I said, it's a cyclical. You buy it when it's low. You don't wait until here. The people who buy up here say, oh, look, it's all hot now. Home building is hot. They're idiots. Any cyclical sort of business, you wait and you buy it when it goes down. So like ABX, I'm sure, is, they're not cheap, but they're not expensive. ABX. Same thing with ABX, though. We were, you know, we were buying the crap out of them down here. And even last year, I was still into them over here, but now I've lost interest. I mean, now it's you know, over 15, I don't care. Under 15, I love them. Over 15, I'm like, eh. You know, I, I, I expect to see 20, maybe 25, but I mean, so what? I only, I only want to buy things when they're on sale. So, so why is the miner not responding? He already, they already responded. That's a response. Here's your response. They went from, from $7 to $20. That's, 300, that's 200% up. So what do you want them to do? Gold didn't go up that much. Gold's not up 200%. That's the response. The problem is, you, you know, you can't expect a constant response. They went, they, they've gone to, they, they were bid up to a price that correctly ascertained the likely price of gold at this point in time. So unless gold does something different than what was expected of it, then they're going to stay at the price that they've already moved to. <clears throat> SMC, yeah, why, what is SMC doing? Why do I fall for these things? It's not even a stock we trade. <laughs> you, mean, you mean the fact they went up and down? All right. Anyway, moving on. See, I said, why do I fall for these things? I knew it before I even went. Oh, Sonic. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm like, I don't play SNC, and I don't know. <laughs> it didn't look like an interesting move. All right, let's give you benefit of the doubt then. Oh, oh, well, that's that's because of Panera. That's all. That's stupid. Wow, that's a big move. I mean, they've been improving anyway, but that's that's a big move up. We get out of Sonic. I think we sold out of Sonic, right? We were we were we were like happy with where they were, and we got out of something at some point. I think. I read Trump's plan of companies to repatriate their cash back will help. Companies park their cash overseas. <laughs> I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't read that. But look, the bottom line is, it's so it, you can't stop companies from not bringing their profits into the United States. The only way we can, but you'd have to have a massive international cooperation that looked at all corporate profits from a global perspective. And allocating the taxes, you know, I know you can't do it because this is all. I, even as I'm saying it, it's like no, that's never gonna, never gonna happen. Okay, we've had the UN for like, you know, uh, 60 years now, and it's never gonna happen. We can't even agree on where where the boundaries of Israel are. <laughs> you know, 60, 70 years after the fact, we still can't agree on that. Um, so we're not going to agree on how we tax every single company on Earth and how it's apportioned out, and who should get the benefit, and so on and so forth. And whatever we do, the companies will get around it anyway. It doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what you do. They're going to, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like in the history of the universe, if we ever crack down on criminals, if we ever crack down on, on uh, drug dealers, if we crack down on money lenders, you know, on illegal loan sharking, <clears throat> you know, illegal gambling, no. You can't stop people from doing stuff. So 
you know, the companies that want to cheat will cheat. End of story. It's like, I, and I could tell you a hundred ways to set it up, but it's a very simple example. It's like, look, let's take those stock work for example. Not that I would, but you guys pay a credit card to subscribe to the service, right? I report my taxes in the United States of America and say, here's the money we took in, here's the money we spent, and here's the money we made in profit, right? All I have to do is have you pay your money to the Cayman Islands where there's no income taxes, and there would be, I'd have my corporation in the Cayman Islands. There's nothing illegal about you paying a Cayman Islands Phil Stock World to, to uh, have your thing. I'm providing the service, so what do you care? Um, and then the Cayman Islands would then send to the United States exactly what I need to cover expenses, and Phil Stock World in the United States would be another corporation that would have collected only, only what I needed from the Cayman Islands. So in other words, the Cayman Islands Corporation is the, holding, is, the, is the credit card processing center for Phil Stock World that I hired, and therefore they remit to me some portion that we agreed on of the, of the amount of money that comes in. So they just send me, let's say, um, half the money, and I take half the money, and I apply it to all my expenses and stuff, and the other half I say, oh, guess there was no profit. There's not, there was no other profit this year in the store. And meanwhile, I'm in the, I've got my credit card, and I've got my, my uh, accountant in the Cayman Islands, and he pays my credit card, he pays all my home bills, and he pays my electric bills, and everything's paid out of the Cayman account. Or they could set up another company that I do declare a small income from the United States that the Cayman Islands pays and hires me as a consultant, and that way I get to get a consulting fee so I'm not completely off the books. There's a, mil you know, there's a million ways to do it. But the point is, if I don't want to pay taxes, I don't pay taxes. Anybody who, who has the ability to hire an accountant and a lawyer can do incredible things to avoid paying taxes. You can incorporate yourself in a ton of ways. If you're not, by the way, if you're not an individual laborer, if you're getting paid by a company, that's a different thing. It's very hard to tell your employer to pay your Cayman Islands account. But if you have your own company, then uh, the world is your oyster from that perspective. Now, let's see what these guys have to say. One speaker. Hello?
because that's also going to cause a demand for dollars. I mean, more notes coming on the market. But the much bigger effect is on rates. So rates, rates will go up. We are heading into a inflationary cycle. It's going to cost you more money. And what that guy was saying was lock. So he's talking to mortgage brokers. He's saying lock your rates. So if you have any homes that are out there, you want to call your clients because nobody wants to have a, a, a sale. Like if you're a mortgage broker and you talk to a guy and you price out his house and say it's going to cost you this much a month, you don't want to have to pick up the phone three days from now and say, oh, no, I'm sorry, it's not going to cost you this much a month instead because the rates went up a quarter point while I was dicking around with your paperwork. So it's your job as a mortgage broker to lock in those rates to your client, and, to, and obviously they have to agree that they want to lock in the rates, and that sets up a cycle. Um, so that's what that was about. Anyway, so that's interesting. That, that was the gist of the Fed minutes, and I guess I, uh, I don't think like anybody really covering that, but that's apparently – we'll take a quick look and see what it says, or I'll look at the summary. I'm not that interested in the Fed minutes right now. But anyway, okay. So – Repatriating cash, they have, look, they, they, they have no interest at all in stopping repatriation. This whole repatriation bullshit, which they've been talking about for, for eight years of Obama, they've been saying, why don't you let us repatriate our funds? They want to bring the money. Again, this goes back to the thing. So I, I've done all this fun stuff. I've avoided paying all my taxes, just like all these companies do. I don't pay any taxes, but my money is in the Cayman Islands. And... If I want to, if I want to spend it here, it's inconvenient. Okay, I'm kind of right at the edge of what's legal. And, and obviously, you could easily look at it and say that's not legal at all. But the point is, I'm right at the edge of what's legal. Because I've got, you know, if I have a corporation, the corporation, the Caymans, is legally taking a fee for processing all the payments for Phil Stockwell. They've got a, you know, I'd have, I'd have a secretary there who answers the phone. I'd have a, a little office. And I'd have, um, you know, and they, and they deal with the credit card companies out there. So then they would remit to me less their handling fee, whatever it is, whatever it is we get remitted. So if I make a bad deal with them, that's not, that's not illegal. It's just me making a bad deal. Obviously, I'm purposely making a bad deal, but that's what, that's what these companies did. Um, so then the problem is the problem, not a big problem, but the problem is all my money is in the Cayman Islands. I'd like to have my money here. It would be nice to have my money in my own banks here and not have to worry about my money being in the Caymans. You know, maybe I, maybe maybe I don't have a good ATM. Uh, you know, maybe my, my ATM privilege is not as good or whatever. Um, you know, if I if I ever want to write a big check, if I want to buy a house, it's hard for me to transfer a few hundred thousand dollars from the Caymans over to here. You know, it's for day to day stuff. It's not. It's nothing. It's like, honestly nothing. You can live like that easily. Um, but for um, you know, for any kind of big things that come up, it's like, yeah, I'd like, you know, if I got five million bucks sitting in the Caymans, I'd like to move at least a couple of million over here. I can't do it because then I'll pay taxes. I mean, I could do it, I could pay the taxes, but ew, who wants to pay taxes, right? <laughs> so these companies have now two trillion dollars overseas. Two trillion dollars that they haven't paid taxes on. That's six hundred billion dollars they've stolen from the US government. And, and now, and, and for eight years, they've been bitching to Obama while they've been piling it up. They've been bitching and bitching. Why do you let us repatriate our money? We'll give you 10%. We'll give you 15%. They, are, they make these offers all the time. Like, how about we do a deal? So Trump's going to let them do it basically for free. $600 billion payday for these guys. $600 billion taken away from all the programs that Trump is cutting. Six hundred billion more that you and I have to pay in taxes. If we, you know, the legitimate taxpayers have to pay in taxes to cover what they're not collecting. But, they, but, the, but the Republicans have no interest in closing the loophole because, God forbid, another Democrat comes in, they want to make sure that you can still do it. They're like, hey, if another guy comes in and wants you to pay taxes, we don't want to pay taxes, so they're going to damn well do it again. Anytime somebody's in the office who doesn't want who who won't let them bring the money in tax free, they won't. And and last time, in fact, the last guy who did it was Bush. Bush let them bring the money back in. They brought the money back in. After Clinton, Clinton wouldn't let them do it, then Bush let them do it. So they brought the money back in. Then Obama wouldn't let them do it. They piled the money up and now now uh, uh Trump's gonna let them bring it back in. It's a freaking scam. But you know, that's what they do. They they put they put the money wherever they want until it's convenient. This year, uh, an Apple. This year and Apple. <laughs> this year, an Apple buying back their shares and boosting special dividends to shareholders. Yeah, well, 
I mean, why not? They've got this swimming cash. And Apple's one of the biggest repatriating. Apple's one of the biggest ones of holding overseas cash. Apple has so, Apple has so much money overseas. I don't think that I don't think you've even got an accurate picture of how much money they make. I don't I don't think they actually are booking the amount of money that they make as a company entirely on their books in this country. I think the I think the cash overseas represents a lot of undeclared profits, but you know what are you going to do about it? So that's why you know so they so that's what they do. They want to find different ways to distribute the money. It's it's, it's you know it, it really borders on money laundering at a certain point. Chinese phones like Huawei. I love this about Huawei. Everybody loves this. Okay, Huawei. They have a big market share. They have a they have a good market share. They make no money. They're not hurting Apple. <laughs> yes, they're much cheaper. Apple doesn't want. Apple does not want to sell it. You know, it's, it's like saying that. Um, you know, it's like saying somebody's eating into Porsche's market share. Porsche sells as many Porsches as they want to sell. You know, it's like they, they look at the thing and they say, okay, we can sell, we figure we can sell this many Porsches and we're going to sell them for this incredible price and we don't have to give anyone incentives, we don't have to give anyone rebates, we don't have to give them special deals. Everybody's going to come in and buy a Porsche and pay 100000 cash or 250000 We don't have to do anything for them at all other than give them a Porsche because that's what they want. And Porsche makes 30, 30% margins on their cars. Other car makers make one percent margin on their cars. So Porsche sells one Porsche sells a million cars, but they make more money than, than Chrysler, selling selling one you know one one tenth as many cars. Because that's their niche. That's what Apple does too. Apple doesn't want to sell a billion iPhones. Because if they sold a billion iPhones, they'd have to sell really, really cheap ones, and the Apple Store would be full of people who are not the kind of people Apple sells to. They don't want the Apple Store to be full of people who can't afford to buy the $50 impulse items and $100 impulse items that are on the shelf at the Apple Store. They certainly don't want the kind of people who buy, uh, who buy a free phone, buy a free phone, who get a free phone from their carrier. They certainly don't want those people taking up space in the Apple Store next to the people who pay, who continue to give them more and more money all the time. Apple wants the top end buyers. They make a phone for the top end buyers. They're not interested in the low end market. Down the road, they will eventually capture the low end market, just like <clears throat> just like with the iPod, where originally they were really high end, and then they got lower and lower and lower until eventually. Everybody has an iPod. Everybody on the planet has an iPod, basically, because they're so freaking cheap that, that there's no reason not to own an iPod, and, and frankly, there are no other music players anymore. And there used to be, there used to be a dozen different music players out there. You used to get any kind of music players, but the iPod was the best one, but you couldn't afford that, so why don't you spend half as much money on this or a quarter as much money on that and so on and so forth? And that went on for years. And you know who was in charge of that, by the way? Tim Cook. That was Tim Cook's job, was, was grinding down the iPhone market. And Tim Cook did exactly the right thing. They had an iPhone, they introduced another iPhone, they made the next iPhone cheaper, they, get, they sold you the old iPhone. For, for, the old iPhone that you already used to dream about that you could never afford suddenly became affordable. Just like right now, you can get for 50 bucks, you can get uh, an iPhone 5. You know, you go to at t store, it's only 50 bucks for an iPhone 5. For wait, what's the wait? Three. So it's $50 more than three now. Eventually, it'll be free. And by the way, it's 50 bucks because the phone company can get you to give them 50 bucks. It's not different. It's really not a different price. It's just that the phone company knows that people pay 50 bucks for the iPhone. They want the 50 bucks. You know, 10 million people give them 50 bucks. It starts to be real money. So it's not $50 because it costs more than a Huawei phone. It's $50 because the, the phone company doesn't want to give it away for free. But the bottom line is that's just the way it works with Apple. Okay, they, They're perfectly happy to run the system for the higher end customers and eventually they know they'll get everybody. Because none of, the, none of their competition is really making money. They are making a fortune because they keep the margin. And they won't put out the phones until they have the margin. Why? Because they're not chasing the low margin clients. 
They're the only ones handling the thing smartly. And that's why they make money hand over fist while everybody else, could, you know, suffers in the market. And that's why they have total control of vendors because even because the vendors who, who supply away, they're not sure if they're going to get paid next year. They don't know how long this will last. And, and, you know, don't forget all the people who went in and tried to challenge Apple on the, um, <clears throat> on the iPod business. There's Sony and Microsoft. You know, these not small companies. These companies with, you know, tens of billions of dollars backing them up. All dead. Everyone dead. Steve Ballmer made the biggest deal about that Microsoft Zoom. Zoom. That was, that was complete disaster. $3 billion completely trashed product line. Because <clears throat> you couldn't beat them. They ground everybody down until there was no one left. And that was their game plan. And that is their game plan that they're going through with the phone. And it took, the iPod it took a decade, but nobody really, you know, at the time, nobody was staring at them while they were doing it. Now, with the iPhone, they're doing the same thing, but everybody's asking, like, oh, why didn't it happen already? How come you're not killing your competition? It's like it takes time. Nothing is stopping Apple from growing. I mean, I, 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 all right, anyway, I, don't, I really shouldn't have to convince people Apple knows what they're doing. So, that, 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 that. Um, yeah, the Fed. Well, oh, yeah, we'll take a look at that, I guess. That's a little boring. But <laughs> so they want to unwind their balance sheet. They're going to unwind their balance sheet. That means they're going to compete with the, uh, with the government, with the Treasury, to sell notes at auction. So you're going to buy, you know, there's going to be more notes for sale, even if, even if well, even if they were decreasing the deficit, but they're not. The, 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 the deficit is going to be larger anyway. So you're going to have the, the government, sell, the Treasury is going to sell more notes each month, and the Fed at the same time is going to try to sell notes too. And, the Fed, and by the way, and that means the Fed won't be buying the notes. If they're selling them, they won't be buying them anymore. I don't even know if there's going to be any demand for these things. So it, it could potentially be catastrophic. So if you want to know what the impact is, the impact could be horrible. But of course, the Fed can always not sell the notes. So you know, unless there's demand, they're not going to really do it. But this is going to be very interesting. Oh, and the worst thing is the Fed, if they take a loss selling the notes, the loss goes against our own budget, and we end up we end up having a bigger budget deficit because the Fed passes on any losses to the Treasury. <laughs> so that could get really ugly. If there's, oh, there's, there's, yes, it's not good. Um, and the market's being real tame about it right now, which is interesting, because I, I think they should really take it a lot more seriously. I, I didn't think they would have the balls to start unwinding. Some Fed officials view stock prices as quite high. <laughs> yeah, no shit. ES is fading 66 late, 66 of the targets. I love code. No code. Oh, 366. Well, here's a good target, 368, because obviously there's a big support line there. Um, how, how's that friend the Russell doing? Maybe he's all messed up now. Here's a dollar, not really moving. So dollars. So dollar non-factor. Russell. Oh, held the line at 1368. Very good. 1368 and 1373 are our significant lines on the Russell. Um, who's missing? The Dow. So far, not bad. Oh, 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 wait, NASDAQ. I didn't really want this many. I made a mistake before. It'll lighten up. So see, now I have a profit. And I'm going to go back to two. There we go. So now I have two at 5477, even though I started in my slower number. Do I have any more? I have four of the Dow, so I should lighten up on the Dow, too. There we go. Now I got two of each. Meanwhile, for those of you who came in before, you just made some good money, right? I mean, this I didn't make any money because I started earlier, but you guys came in at the right time. Some good payoff here. How's oil doing? Ooh. Oh, that was before. Okay. Well, we're drifting along. I'm, I'm doing my oil. Okay, now I'm looking for a much bigger breakdown in this. And look at, the, you know, look at how the Russell is sort of fading out, and it looks like it's consolidating for a move down. And these guys are going to sharply come back down with it. <clears throat> so 
Where, where are we talking about now? 20,800, right? So we got 30 points there. We did 75 here, something like that. And we were, uh, whatever we were at 80 here. So, yeah, not a lot of money. It was a little bit of money. Everybody made a little bit of money, so that's good. I did my job. See, that is my job. I just saw you guys how to make money. All right, and now let's take a look at the Fed. 2.30. Oh, let me see. Oh. You. You. Why did it have blown up? Uh, or maybe I left it. Does it remember how you blew up your page? Yeah, it does. That's cool. Oh, wow. So last time we were here, probably we were looking at something and I blew it up. Because we were, I was showing it to you guys, right? Ugh. I'm not reading these. Sorry. I'm not in the mood. Um, yes, summer here. Open oh, market committee. I mean, this is a minutes of a meeting of boring government people. Staff review. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay, information reviewed for the March 14, 15 meeting suggested the labor market strengthened. January, February, real GDP was continuing to expand at slower pace in the fourth quarter. Some flowing reflects in transitory and 12 month change in consumer prices moved up and was close to the committee's longer run objective of 2%, excluding food and energy. Inflation was a little changing. Things were on below 2%. Non-farm payroll increased at a brisk pace. That certainly is still happening. Unemployment is back down. Um, mm -hmm. Labor force participation. Excuse me. See, I'm boring myself. Uh, the share of workers employed and the economic reasons a little changed. The rate of private sector job openings was unchanged. The rate of hiring edged up, or we moving average. This is a, the, the important thing about this is you get the idea of what the Fed thinks the market is doing, or, or the economy is doing. Labor compensation uh, rose at a moderate rate. That means they're not worried about it yet. Compensation per hour increased three and a quarter percent. Oh, but that's a lot. And average hourly earnings increased two and three quarter percent over 12 months. That's actually ahead of inflation. It's amazing. The unemployment rate for African Americans, Hispanics, and whites were close to the level seen just before the recent recession. <laughs> oh, okay. I was gonna say, why would you break it up? Why would you name African Americans, Hispanic, and whites, and then and then generalize it? Well, here goes the but. But the unemployment rate for African Americans and Hispanic remained at, at, above the rate for whites. Oh, really? Wow. Call the 60s. We've just made the discovery. Over the past year, so the jobless rate for African Americans moved lower, while the Hispanics and whites moved roughly sideways. Total industrial output decline, and well, we're kicking out the Hispanics, so hopefully uh, we'll see what happens. Total industrial production declined in January, um, unseasonably, uh, you know, I say global warming, unseasonably warm weather reduced the demand for heating, which held down the output of utilities, mining output expanded. Following. See, now that's interesting, because that seems to me the GDP is going to get a big hit from this, because the output of utilities is a lot. Mining output expanded further following gains. Manufacturing continues to rise. Automakers assembly skits with motor vehicle production remain near its pace. But we know that but we know auto vehicles took a hit actually. Over the next few months, while broader indicated manufacturing production, it's, they were making the cars, but they're piling up on the lots. That's the problem. And new orders index and national manufacturers point to modest gains in battery output. Real consumption appears to be rising at a slower pace. Everything's slowing. In the fourth quarter, motor vehicle, everything is slowing. Everything is like it's okay, it's expanding, it's slow, but still the market is up 15% since Trump, and and nothing is actually justifying it. Motor vehicle sales stepped down February uh, from the brisk pace. I mean, down. You shouldn't have the word down when you're at all-time record highs in the market. Uh, warm weather prompted a decline in spending on energy services, taking together components of nominal retail sales. Uh, we're unchanged after a robust gain in January. Recent readings on some key factors influence spending, including further gains in employment, real personal income, home that work, resistance with increases in DCE, uh, da, 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 da. so so nothing. Uh, recent information on housing, suggested residential. All right, so there's nothing here. Um, this smells for balance sheet information. E A. Okay. Ah. Several briefings, okay, 
These briefings discuss the macroeconomic alternative strategies and the committee can employ with respect to reinvestments. Briefings consider the advantages and disadvantages of phasing out reinvestments and whether you're using the same approach. In the discussion, the policymakers reaffirm the approach to the balance sheet normalization, articulated in the normalization principle plans, blah, blah. They haven't changed their minds since 2014. In particular, uh, agreed reductions in the securities holdings should be gradual and predictable. Okay, that makes sense. And accomplished by phasing out reinvestments of principal received from these holdings. So in other words, they're they're basically just letting things expire and not buying new stuff. But the, but that's tapering. That's what that is. Remember they talked about tapering back in 2014. This is just more tapering. And it really did that really was not painful. Obviously, it was not painful at all for the economy. Most participants expect that so they're not going to sell their notes. They're only going to stop buying them. Well, the problem is still, though, the Fed is the primary buyer of government debt. So that's going to be a little bit tricky. And they do, do expect rates to go up. Um, but, but we'll see how much. There's still a huge demand for U.S. dollars and U.S. And, and US bonds, so I don't think it's really going to kill us. I mean, one of the reasons that people are buying so many junk bonds, ah, that's the problem. It's going to finally hit the junk market, I bet. Because one of the reasons people are buying so many junk bonds is because there simply aren't enough U.S. bonds available. All these corporate bonds and stuff, the reason they fill so quickly is because everybody's got their money in cash and they can't buy. There aren't enough U.S. bonds being issued by the government. It's only $100 billion a month. That's not that much. And, and frankly, I, I heard on... I believe the debt right now, the, the, the last budget Obama did was only a, five, a $600 billion debt only. So uh, it's only $50 billion a month that we're borrowing. That's not enough to satisfy the demand for U.S. bonds. So that's why they get bid lower and lower, and people, it, the bidders, when you, have a low, when you have a low supply of bonds, it's the bidders that have to then bid lower and lower rates of interest to get the bonds. They have to offer to accept a lower rate of return in order to get the bond from you. So we'll find out where the equilibrium point is. And I think the Fed is probably going to do it the right way, so I'm not too worried about it. <coughs> Most participants expect to be changes in the target rate. Should be the primary reason adjusting. Uh, stance, such as low bond. That won't. A number of participants uh, indicated the comments should read. Resume asset purchases only if oh, oh resume asset purchases only if something very horrible happens. That's good. Then they leave themselves some firepower. That's why. Committee's policy maintaining reinvestments and normalization. Well, the way had supported. Oh yes, yeah, so they pat themselves on the back and saying how great they did. All right, that's not very exciting. I wouldn't make a big deal of it. I'll read more about it. We'll figure it out. But I mean, to me, this does not sound like anything ground ground shaking, groundbreaking, whatever. And good, no questions on that. Okay, fantastic. Let's see now what the Wall Street Journal says about it, though. That's more important. WSJ. So it doesn't matter what they actually said. What matters is the spin on what they said. That's more important. Now, what did Bannon do wrong? Steve Bannon has been removed. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, I don't know why. We will find out, I guess, why this happened. Hit me there. It's a shame they're such a big place. Ah, here we go. Whoa, what? Officials were undecided over phasing out. I didn't sound like that to me, but I knew the whole thing. All right, so so this is this is gonna cause a little bit of worry if this is the interpretation. Um, Federal Reserve officials agreed March policy they would like begin shrinking their portfolio. I thought it was 4.3, 4.5, wow. <laughs> as, if, as, if another five, as if another couple hundred billion matters at this point. They remain undecided on tactical minutes and more meaning how to answer questions. Shrinking the balance sheet is a delicate... Okay, oh, here you go. They're telling you what to do. Shrinking the balance sheet is a delicate task because it could cause long-term rates to rise and undermine the expansion. The Fed's holdings grew from less than a trillion before the crisis. So they've added $3.5 trillion to their balance sheet. And they've been uh, maintaining these holdings at a high level and reinvesting the proceeds, and which means they're constantly just buying treasuries, constantly. 
And so if they stop buying treasuries, now we have to find out what the open market wants to buy treasuries or not. And I'm pretty sure they do, though. I'm pretty sure there's still a strong demand. Um, official source, slow phase out the least disruptive way, but also possibly hard to communicate early. Uh, officials have been speaking out about plans for meeting under emerging strategy to outline public documents. The central bank would have to raise short-term rates two more times and then potentially pause while setting in motion in an effort to reduce the balance sheet. The pause would allow the Fed to watch the ill effects. When we decide to be in normalized balance sheet, we might actually decide at the same time to take a pause in the raising the short-term rate. Okay, so they'll, they'll, they'll carry and stick you uh, in this thing. Really not a bad thing. I'm not, I'm, I'm not terribly worried about it. It seems like a perfectly rational way to go. But uh, we'll see what happens. But they do this. You know, the problem with the Fed is they're so, they're so all in right now that they have to pull back because otherwise, if anything does go wrong, they've got nothing. You know, they've, they've got to have what they call spare firepower to do something with. How's our uh, index is doing? Oh, very nice, very nice. Oh, I can't believe you would let me short you. Yeah, that's nice. 555 there and 680 there. Oh. Good God, I wish I could listen. I wish I could go to a webinar where I made this kind of money. <laughs> That'd be great. Let's see. Um, oh, wait, I am a one. <laughs> How nice. And how's oil doing? Let's see. Is oil coming down for me? Oh, come on, baby. This, the only one I care about is oil. I care less about the indexes, but I do care deeply about the oil coming down. So hopefully that will come down too. All right, fantastic. Uh, I think I'm going to wrap this up because my voice is certainly uh, – Doing as good as expected, but my throat's feeling a bit sore at this point. Any last questions before we go? No grammar. Nope. Okay, cool. All right, so everything is good. Uh, portfolios are very good. We're, I mean, it's just insane. 177% on the uh, 5% portfolio. And Butterfly, 230. 230. Oh, oh I was up by 1%. That's pretty good. And the long term, 162. One, 161. Oh, well, I should have said 152. Damn it. I thought, I, oh, it tra it's probably not reflecting the, the pullback yet. Uh, 162.6. And the short term, geez, uh, 330. Yes, 333. <laughs> So we're all in great shape. Everything's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And um, and I really, I can't tonight. Oh, I really got to finish up my review. I started doing a review, but it's, it's so much work, guys. It really is. I hate doing these portfolio reviews. Um, but I will try to get it finished certainly by the weekend. Let's put it that <laughs> And because after that, I mean, then, then we're into, it's already going to be the 10th next week, and then we're going to have to uh, start thinking about our adjustments for uh, option expiration. So busy, busy, but everything's going well, and uh, you know, hopefully, we'll get a little bit of a pullback. Well, not a severe pullback, but a little bit of a pullback would be nice. I'd like to see a completion of the five percent move that we didn't actually get. Um, if you look at the big chart. I know Jean Luc probably did one today, so let's take a look. Oh, yeah, he did do one today. I remember. So on our big chart. We're going to test these fifty-day moving averages, but what I'd really like to see is a pullback of about maybe at least 2.5% below that. So you're looking at here on the S&P, like around 2,300 on the Dow, 2,250, 20,250. On the NASDAQ, you'd be looking at 5,300. It's 140 points down from here. Um, that's 2,800 bucks on a futures contract. Uh, and on the Russell, we'd be looking at probably the Russell would lead us lower. So I said the Russell can get all the way back down to 1320, which is a good $4,500 drop from where we are now. Um, so that, that's what we're going to be looking for. And if we do that, what's going to happen? Okay, see this, leg, see this leg here? This leg keeps going down, hits 1320, and what does that do? That makes a perfect bottom channel here, right? 1320. 
a perfect channel going down here, intersecting with the 200-day moving average, then at the same time we'll be moving up to meet it. And then you'll have a serious inflection point. And at the same time, don't forget, we're getting all the earnings report. And they are going to make or break us. So it's going to be, this is going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you now, this is going to happen. We're going to pull back. Let's look at the S&P. I'll give you a number on that. So on the S&P, we're going to come down to 2320-ish around with 25% line. And then it's going to be up to, you know, a nice straight line going there, down to this, and then the, this 200-day moving average will come up here. And if earnings are good, we'll hold that line and move back up. And if earnings are bad, then we're going to come all the way down to here. Not here, though. This will be moving up, so it'll be like 2250. Or maybe, or maybe this line will hold actually so it'll be some water here. But somewhere around here, so you'll be in the 22s anyway. But I, I would say it's a very good bet that we're going to be down to this 2325 line right there. And so all your indexes are going to follow suit. So on the big chart, you can see exactly where you're going to go. Another quarter point to another 2.5%, which is any one of these lines, is your next stop. And then it's going to be, and then it's going to be up to earnings. And then we'll have to see what the earnings actually come out of. I think disappointing. I just think there's too much, uh, as I wrote this morning, you can't expect 9.1% growth. The comps last year were not that terrible, maybe in the energy sector, but I don't think the energy sector is recovered enough to, to make that a significant improvement. And the banking sector, I think they never they never bad year last year. It wasn't terrible. So I don't know where they think all this money is going to come from. I'm sure it's only coming from retail. So we will see. So very interesting. All right, we'll do it again next week. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, let's see, there's a black read, there's a black read. Okay. Are you still holding your oil short? Yes, I am. I'm holding my oil short. I have, uh, I, as I said uh, earlier in chat, I said, look, I got 10 shorts. I'm down uh, $6,000. $6, I'm down $6,000 on my 10 contracts, 60 cents per contract. And um, I didn't feel, I didn't, well, I would have, I, as I said, I should have bought more. Cause I had, had I bought more, I would have been even at this point. But I didn't, so that's the end of it. Um, and I do have conviction, though. So, in fact, if it goes back up, I would go. I, I regret not buying more when it was higher. So, if it does go higher, I'll probably buy more unless there's some phenomenal reason for it. But I don't see any good reason for it to be up right now. And plus, you've got the rollover pressure coming up on the new contracts, and I think that's going to cause some big problems. All right. So, you know, with, so within the next two weeks, I, I see a serious downside catalyst, and I don't see any upside catalyst that makes me not want to hold on to them. So for the moment, I'm holding them. I would, I, I want to get back to two contracts and not have ten contracts. But on the whole, I, I those two contracts, I certainly want to hold. Uh, over, you know, I, I mean, until I get like at least to fifty, I want to at least get my, I want to at least get my thousand per contract at fifty. You know, the ones I have now, I'll, I'll be happy to get out even if we get back to fifty point fifty. But it, but the other, the, the two I'm going to hold, I want to at least squeeze out fifty out of those guys. And who knows? I might get lucky. It might go all the way to 47.50 or something like that. But I am expecting a big push down when these contracts roll over in the next couple of weeks. All right. Thanks a lot for coming, everybody, and I'll see you all next week.